Hi Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Liu. Welcome back to my channel. Black holes, they are one of the most fascinating and mysterious objects in the universe. But now a new study has put even more into question. Is it possible that black holes, the things with so much gravity that not even light can escape them, are also the origins of another mystery in our universe? Dark energy, that's the thing causing the rapid expansion of the universe. Have I confused you yet? Let's discuss. Albert Einstein in 1915 published his field equations that describe the relationship between the geometry of space-time and the distribution of matter and energy within it. Most famously, it's written like this, where g mu nu encodes the curvature of space-time and t mu nu describes the distribution of matter and energy. Just a year later, physicist Carl Schwarzschild found a mathematical solution to Einstein's field equations in general relativity that describes the space-time around a stationary, spherically symmetric mass. He showed that objects with mass would warp space-time, like when you place any mass onto a sheet of stretched material, it stretches down. The more mass an object has, the more it warps space-time fabric. The solution predicts the existence of an event horizon, which is a boundary beyond which nothing, not even light, can escape the gravitational pull of an object. In other words, a black hole. But as we all know, in nature, things aren't static. They're moving around. Every celestial body we know of is rotating about an axis. Like our Earth, it spins around our poles. This led to Roy Kerr in 1963 extending his research to develop a solution to Einstein's equations that incorporate angular momentum and causes black holes to spin. Today, in the case of black holes, there are only three physical parameters that we need to describe every single black hole. Firstly, how massive they are. Secondly, how fast they spin. And thirdly, how much charge they carry, like electron charge. The Kerman-Newman solution incorporates the electric charge aspect and is the most general solution of black holes. Observations from gravitational wave measurements of binary black hole mergers and direct imaging of supermassive black holes have shown extremely good agreement with these models. But there are also several theoretical problems that arise from all three of these models. One of such is the biggest problem, I think, is that black holes are predicted to have a singularity at their centers. These are points of infinite density, the existence of which violates all known physics. Another problem is that they're based on the assumption of an asymptotically flat space-time. This means that if you get far away enough from a black hole, its gravitational influence should be negligible and space-time looks more and more flat. But we know in nature that space-time is not flat, it's curved, and black holes are definitely not isolated systems. In 1917, Einstein added the cosmological constant parameter lambda as a fudge factor to his field equations to counter the effects of gravity and produce a static universe, because at the time they thought the universe was stationary. But later, when it was observed that the universe was expanding, he removed it. Today, we believe the universe is undergoing an accelerated expansion. This means that it's expanding faster today than it was in the past. The further away galaxies are from us, the faster they're moving away from us. So what's causing this? Well, we don't really know, but we can attribute it to dark energy, because we just don't know what it is. The cosmological constant contributes to the energy density of space-time, and it creates a repulsive force that causes space-time to expand. The cosmological constant was thus revived and reinterpreted as dark energy in the form of a vacuum energy, a background energy density that also arises in quantum mechanics due to the interaction of virtual particles. But asymptotically flat universes also don't agree with the cosmological constant, and this is because when the cosmological constant is non-zero, it causes space-time to curve, so you can't have an expanding universe that is also asymptotically flat. 
So this is where the problem comes in. Right now, our best black hole models just don't agree with an expanding universe. But a recently published paper, which I'll link down below, may have the first observational evidence as to why this might be. What if black holes are the source of dark energy, and in particular, vacuum energy? That behind the event horizon, the boundary of no return, is dark energy. Well, this isn't the first time such an idea would have been proposed. Gravistars, short for gravitational vacuum stars, are theoretical objects proposed as an alternative to black holes. These dense, compact objects are held together by the energy of the vacuum of space, rather than by the gravitational attraction of matter. But as you might expect, gravistars reflect any incoming radiation, so aren't at all like the objects we know as black holes. Currently, there is no observational evidence to support the existence of gravistars in nature. In March 2005, however, physicist George Chaplin claimed that quantum mechanics makes it nearly impossible that black holes exist, but they are instead dark energy stars. These dense compact objects are believed to be filled with dark energy, but unlike gravistars, they would be stable, self-gravitating objects held together by the pressure of dark energy. The idea being that any infalling matter onto a black hole, which we now call a dark energy star, would be converted into vacuum energy, or dark energy, as the matter falls through the event horizon. Now, if these black holes are cosmologically coupled to dark energy, then as the universe expands, they would also gain even more vacuum energy. And since we know from Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, energy is equivalent to mass. So as the universe expands, the objects gain more energy, and hence also more mass, just like a black hole. But we know that energy has to be conserved, so where is all this energy coming from? Well, it turns out that in cosmology, energy is not expected to be conserved. Instead, in cosmology, we have the equation of state. P equals W times rho, that relates density to pressure. In the case of dark energy, W is minus one, or lower. From GR, we know that the energy density of the cosmological constant is uniform and constant, unlike radiation and matter. So it does not get diluted as the universe expands. But the energy density has to be conserved. And for this to happen, you need negative pressure. So the increase in dark energy in the universe gives us a stronger negative pressure that is the source of the accelerated expansion of the universe, pushing everything away from each other. This thus leads to an observable test. If black holes are cosmologically coupled, then the growth of black holes in mass should be more than what we would expect if they were just feeding on the material around them alone. So to do so, we need to compare the mass of a black hole at different times in history. Using this equation here, ma is the mass of the black hole at scale factor a. Recall that this is a measure of how much the universe has expanded normalized to today. So the scale factor today is a equals one, and at the big bang, the scale factor was a equals zero. A subscript i is the scale factor at which cosmological coupling happens. So m of A subscript I is the mass of the black hole when the cosmological coupling happens. And in this case, dark energy became dominant in our universe at a redshift of about 0.7 to 0.8, when the universe was about seven to eight billion years old. This was when the energy density of dark energy exceeded that of matter. K is a measure of the cosmological coupling strength. You can see that if K equals zero, then the mass of the black hole doesn't change. On the other hand, vacuum energy interior solutions to the field equations produce k equals three. So we need to compare the mass of a black hole today to how they were seven to eight billion years ago and see if there's been any excess growth not due to the merging of black holes or the accretion of matter, but instead only due to vacuum energy. Unfortunately, we don't have eight billion years on our hands to wait around and track the mass of a single black hole, but instead, the scientists took samples of faraway black holes at redshifts 0.7 to 0.8, 
0 0.8 to 0 0.9, and 0 0.7 to 2.5. Remember, the further away they are, the further back in time we're seeing them. And then compared them to black holes in our local universe, so at a redshift of zero, to see how much difference there is in growth. In particular, to make sure that they can account for only growth due to cosmological coupling, they looked at solely supermassive black holes at the center of massive elliptical galaxies. And this is because these black holes tend to be quiescent. That means that they're not actively feeding. And galaxy-galaxy merging shouldn't, on average, increase the black hole mass relative to the mass of the stars in these galaxies. So if there's no cosmological coupling and black holes grow naturally, then you shouldn't expect any difference in the black hole growth. But it turns out that the black holes are indeed growing at a much faster rate than we would expect. This isn't completely new, however. It's actually pretty well accepted that black holes in the early universe grew faster than we expected. However, what is new here is that they've measured the black holes to be growing in mass by a scale factor of a to the power of three. The value of k they measure is free, and this is the value you'd expect if these black holes were cosmologically coupled to the expansion of the universe. That means the universe is expanding, the black holes are expanding, and they're gaining more dark energy. And if you assume this to be true, as well as that black holes only form from the collapse of massive stars, and they alone account for the cosmological constant, that means all of the black holes can perfectly account for all of the dark energy in the universe. In the budget of our universe, about 68% of our universe is dark energy. That's the majority of our universe. Only 27% is dark matter, and the remaining 5% ordinary matter that we're more familiar with interacting with in our day-to-day -day lives. That is a lot of dark energy hiding in those tiny little black holes. But like I said, they're not really black holes anymore. Instead, we should be calling them dark energy stars. What's really nice about dark energy stars is that you no longer have this information destroying singularity at the center, so physics can actually explain it. Additionally, the theoretical prediction of k equals 3 was developed from a Robertson-Walker cosmology metric. That simply means that it doesn't assume an asymptotically flat universe. So it doesn't suffer from all of those problems that we've been having with current black hole models. And now it seems that we have some sort of observational evidence to support it too. However, despite being an interesting idea, there is some concern about their galaxy selection having potential biases that can influence the measured growth rate of the black holes. And there's also the open questions like, what happens when two black holes, or dark energy stars, merge? How can that be possible? We have observed black hole merging, but dark energy, dark energy balls merging together? I'm sure it won't be the last time we hear of this, so there's definitely more research to be done, so keep your eye out on this one. So there you have it, supermassive black holes are growing in mass far more quickly than we thought, and it seems to be directly tied to the expansion of the universe. So maybe black holes don't exist at all and are instead dark energy stars. Einstein actually never believed in them anyway. That's all for this week's video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share and subscribe.